Okay. Hey, morning, Joe. How's it going? Hey, man. It's been one hell of a week. But the first thing we have to say is happy International Women's Day. Um, it's, a, it's a big thing. And uh, I know that there are events and celebrations um, all over the country. And, um, you know, if you can go to one, we have one here in New York. Uh, it, and it, it looks like it's gonna be a, a really spectacular event. I know um, you'll be speaking, uh, uh, historian Robin D.G. Kelly, who wrote, who wrote right. Robert Ho, right. a groundbreaking book on the Communist Party in Alabama. Right. Um, and he's also written, you know, books on jazz. He has a wonderful book out on Monk and so, some others. So, and then Leith Mullings, mm. who's an yep. outstanding uh, scholar and a longtime uh, activist. So we're going to have quite a program. But again, if you don't come to, to ours, and by the way, it will be streamed live here on Facebook at 7 o'clock this evening. So, you know, tune in. And the event itself is held at the um, the building on 23rd Street in New York, right? Yes, the Winston uh, Unity Hall. So, um, yeah, check us out. Now, um, let's see. Manafort got four years. Less than four years, 47 months. months. What happened? What the hell happened? You know, the judge, the judge apparently said, uh, um, you know, talked about the man's blameless life. I don't, with all that's come to light about him, I don't know how you could consider anything uh, that he does blameless. This guy is an old CIA guy, you know, who, along with uh, that other guy, um, the one that has Nixon on his back. Roger Stone, yeah. Roger Stone. These guys were. He looks like a cartoon character, honestly. These guys were operatives in assisting the racist regime of South Africa. They were giving money to a group called UNITA in Angola, you know, to fight on behalf of South Africa against the freedom fighters from MPLA. You know, they're, they're, they are notorious, dirty tricksters. And even just looking at the, the, the details of, of this case, well, I forget exactly what the charges were. Uh, basically, um, fraud and all that kind yeah, of yeah, a huge, a huge, and in ways that you know uh, undermined our democracy. You know what democracy we have, what little of it. Um, you know, I'm comparing it in my head to the case of uh, Tanya McDowell a few years ago in Connecticut, right. a homeless woman from Bridgeport who used someone else's address to. Uh, get her kid into a better public school. Exactly. You know, public schools in this country are not equal. Um, exactly. She was sentenced to five years in prison, and the person whose address she used, with their consent, uh, they were kicked out of their public housing um, for wanting a, a better life for their kid. Five years. There is no justice, you know. That's why people become so cynical, because there is no justice. If you're rich and privileged, you know, you get special treatment. But if you're poor, and underprivileged or unprivileged, you and especially uh, you especially if you're uh, in, T in Tanya McDowell's case, a, a poor African American woman, um, the the deck is <laughs> more than stacked against you. And that's uh, why we need a radical reform of the criminal justice system, you know, on behalf of the uh, working class and people of color and women in this country. Because you know, sometimes I fantasize about. You know what it would be like if you know the people the bible says that what the, the the first shall be made last and the last shall be made first uh, yeah. but sometimes i wonder i fantasize about what would happen if the robber barons and the bank ceos and the you know the manaforts and the madoffs and everyone were treated like um poor working class african-american or native or latino people uh, in the criminal justice system. Right, uh, right, right. It's kind of like a reverse Planet of the Apes kind of yeah, yeah. scenario, right? Yeah, there'd be, there'd be all oh, hell would break loose, you know? They'd be, I think they would have a hard time. <laughs> I remember when, when the um, steel crisis uh, happened in, in Ohio 
in uh, Northeast Ohio, in Youngstown, Cleveland, and Warren, and mm -hmm. parts. I remember that, you know, certain sections of the population that were doing well off, when they lost their jobs, oh my God, they, they took it really, really hard, much harder than the African American and Puerto Rican population who had always had it hard, you know? Yeah. But who, they, who were experienced you know, it. Groups committing suicide, drowning themselves, shooting themselves, and those who survived ended up, you know, severe drug abuse, alcohol. They just didn't know how to cope, you know? But that's the, you know, that's one of the, the sort of narratives around what's happening in the country right now, you know? Um, people are talking about, you know, the crisis of rural America, the opioid right. crisis, the right. desperation and poverty, and right. all those things are very real. Um, yeah, yeah. But there's a very legitimate question, you know, where was all this concern when this has been happening to the African American community, to the Latino community for, for decades, generations? Uh, yes. Um, well, you know, from that point of view, I feel like we shouldn't, uh, you know, like give hierarchies to levels of yeah. oppression. Uh, we have to unite on the basis of the real, you know, conditions that exist. And at the same time, understand the historic inequalities that have been addressed uh, and directed against women and people of color. You know, and understand the system measures to address it. Mm. Understand the system that that uh, generates and perpetuates those is the same one that's responsible for the, you know, uh, the crisis in rural America, the crisis of um, There's of capitalism, poverty. people. It's the ruling class. It's the 1%. It's Trump. It's not the Mexicans. You know, mm -hmm. it's not black people taking your jobs, you know? And it's not, it's not, uh, it's not poor white people that are dragging it's the rich country. white people who are exporting those jobs abroad, mm -hmm. you know, to the third world where they pay them a penny an hour. That's what's going on. Yeah. So we we, one of the up, things we say is a dream world, huh? One of the things we say is no double standards. That's what that's what equal, that's part of equality. Um, right. So thinking about Manafort and McDowell, thinking about you know all the injustices, no double standards. No double um, standards. Which brings us to uh, to Ilan Omar. And, yes. Um, so uh, can you give us kind of an overview of of how how things have unfolded, Joe? Well, you know, I haven't been following it extremely closely, but it seems that the uh, representative from Minnesota, who's an outstanding uh, advocate for women and for poor and working people, uh, made a comment earlier in the week uh, in which she said that there were certain forces in this country that were pushing for uh, loyalty to other countries. And that was interpreted by some of the Jewish members of Congress, uh, particularly a representative from New York as a, what they're calling an anti-Semitic trope. And you know, uh, there is a history of that, um, but I have to say that I wasn't aware of that history. I had never heard that in connection to the Jewish uh, people. And so I imagine that that was the case uh, with respect to her, you know, and um, and so there was a big uproar. And I guess the House of Representatives uh, passed a resolution yesterday condemning all forms of anti-Semitism and racism and Islamophobia and anti-gay and prejudice and, and so on and, and so forth. It's actually a it, it's quite a good resolution. Um, because it, it specifically targets uh, the events in Charlottesville. Mm. Um, it, it points out that, you know, uh, that Jews are not the only people who've been targeted with this, um, this, this attack of dual loyalty. It's also been widely applied to Muslims in the United States, especially by the right wing, mm. uh, to Catholics. They, they mention uh, JFK's um, presidential campaign. So it's, it's a strong resolution that really, I think, directs blame where it's due, which is on the, the far right. Um, and you know, the, the, the hypocrisy, um, you know, of this issue is that the Republicans have been the biggest anti-Semites out there, mm -hmm. you know, repeatedly. And, you know, so, you know, where were all of these, you know, cries of 
uh, mm. outrage when you know uh, the Republicans were engaging in in these kinds of and even Trump was circulating tweets, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. messages and so yeah, on. Yeah, talking about really like you know, resurrecting these uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories around like George Soros and um, yeah. But uh, you know, look, anti-Semitism is not a myth. It exists. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm acutely aware of is this term of the Jewish lobby, you know, I don't like it, you know. I don't like it because it singles out a particular people for being a, a, a influence group, you know. You never hear about the WASP li lobby, the white <laughs> and Protestant lobby. And they're the biggest lobby on the planet. Well, the, the WASP lobby is just called capital. <laughs> you know what I mean? But 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 people who come out of the United Kingdom are not who live in the United States are not singled out, you know, as, you know, purveyors of greed and influence and, you know, manipulation and control the way the Jewish people are. And, and, and you know, so the, the term itself, I think, is, at least in my view, extremely problematic. And so you have to be sensitive to that, that there is a national question with, you know, that involves the Jewish people. And, um, and uh, we can't ignore that, you know, as we, you know, build unity and uh, take on what is uh, a fascist minded administration that is using race and, and anti-Semitism as organized. I'm sorry, go ahead. Say no, I was saying we have to, and we have to, again, sort of lay blame where it's due. Um, criticism of the, uh, apartheid policies of Israel is not anti-Semitic. Um, the, the, the Netanyahu government does not represent, speak for all Jewish people. It doesn't even speak for the majority of, of the people of Israel from what no. I understand. It is no. just no. As, as Trump and his, you know, his fascist leaning, fascist minded clique do not represent the majority of the American people. The same for Netanyahu, the, 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 the apartheid policies pursued by Israel, this horrible uh, law declaring Israel the nation state of the Jewish people, um, relegating Palestinians legally, formally to second class status, that is Outrageous. the work of the far right. It is not, um, it does not represent the, the Jewish people as a whole, or even the Israeli people as a whole. Yeah, and criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitism. Come on, you know, forget about it. And, uh, but you know, this, this uh, device is being used, uh, you know, in the UK against Corbyn, Corbyn. Yep. the Labour Party, and, and now it has uh, stepped foot in the United States. And uh, I think it's wrong to, go after so-called identity politics as the culprit here, you know, uh, even though there, there are right-wing uh, uh, elements in different nations and different nationalities that, that, that use nationalism, extreme right-wing nationalism, you know, in order to promote their point of view and policies. Um, but at the same time, there are there is a left in each of these communities, nations, and nationalities, and a criticism of of what's uh, of the nation is not necessarily, uh, and in most cases, not a criticism of the uh, people. And and we need to, I think we need to be aware that there's sort of this this vicious cycle um, that involves the two different factions of the ruling class. So. Um, we see over and over again this thing where, you know, uh, uh, class consciousness rises, criticisms of capitalism, of neoliberalism begin to be introduced. And then the right wing, as it did in the 1930s in Germany, sneaks in, uses anti-Semitism, uses racism, uses sexism to try and distort that. Yeah. To say, oh, you know, it's the, the fault of, you know, it's because women now make more than men, or it's because immigrants are taking the jobs, or... You know, it's the Jewish banking, whatever, the globalists or, right. or this, that. And they, they use that to distort, right, the class consciousness that's growing. 
Right. Um, and some and 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 folks on the left, unfortunately, sometimes fall for that. So we get things like, oh, the, this this not just neglect of, but but vicious rejection of and opposition to identity politics um, mm. that I think opens the left to to these attacks from the right wing. And then that further enables the, let's say, centrist center right forces of the ruling class to to dismiss all critiques of capitalism as somehow tainted with racism or anti-Semitism, which is what's happening with Corbyn. So there's yeah. this vicious cycle and we have to break out of it. We have to insist, I think, that the class struggle and the, the democratic struggle or the struggle for equality for uh, racially and nationally oppressed people, women, uh, et cetera, you can't separate them. They have to be, they have exactly, to- Exactly, exactly. So let there be no misunderstanding. We stand with the representative from Minnesota in a fight uh, on behalf of women and oppressed people and the representative from Detroit took John Conyers place and uh, with uh, AOC and, uh, and by the way, uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren took good positions on mm -hmm. the issue early on and that is to their credit, I think. So it looks like um, Joe Biden is going to jump into the presidential race and uh, Sherrod Brown dropped out yesterday. Um, so things are heating up in the Democratic. Are you a Biden man? Do you live in Pennsylvania? I, I, I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's from Scranton, right? Right. Uh, but he's now, he represents Delaware or represented Delaware. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, whatever, <laughs> I guess that's my, that's my take. Somebody was posting early on about, uh, on Facebook about like, Woo, so excited, uh, Beto O'Rourke, Joe Biden, who's it gonna be? And I think the comment I made was, uh, um, Joe Biden is cold pizza and warm beer and Beto O'Rourke is the stock photo that comes in a picture frame. Uh, <laughs> like neither of them seem particularly like- well, You'll see what happens. The energy at this electorate is very volatile. And uh, yeah. I still think that there's a possibility that a dark horse candidate uh, is it, uh, they may be already in, in the race that's going to electrify the mm -hmm. uh, country. And, uh, but I may be wrong, but we'll, we'll see what uh, happens. I think people want change, you know, I think people want change and, uh, but they also want to defeat Trump. Mm -hmm. So there will be a balance between uh, change and, uh, and uh, defeating. Yeah. And, the, and the important thing to remember is that the, I think anyways, is that the, it's not the, the candidate that forms the movement. It's the movement that shapes the, the political terrain that-, that um, Well, there's a hell of a movement out there. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's uh, deep and thoroughgoing and, uh, um, and that's a good thing. Speaking of movements, uh, there was a bill put in before the Congress last week calling for Medicare for all. And uh, that is our action of the week. Uh, you can find a uh, uh, petition uh, on our website at cpusa.org and also on our Facebook page. We urge you to circulate it, share it with a friend. It's a very important uh, development. Um, and uh, so that, you know, people will have finally access to health care. And that's all the importance of the Sanders candidacy last a time because it it uh, put issues before the electorate that moved the discussion. To and, and, and also the importance of, of the Affordable Care Act, which, you know, it, it was not what, what was needed. It was not, it was only a, a fraction of first step, but without that work in 2010 of, 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 of winning that, um, we wouldn't be talking about Medicare for all. Right? Absolutely. Again, happy International Women's Day. Um, hope you join us tonight here on Facebook uh, for our Not Going Back program featuring uh, Robin D.G. Kelly and uh, Professor Leif Mullings. I'll also be sharing uh, some stories. So, um, and if not, then we will see you next week. So have a good one and uh, fight the ruling class power. Mm -hmm.
fight the ruling class power. Take care. You Have too, Joe. Bye-bye. See you later.